I will just uh, once a month would work quite nice. Welcome everybody. Uh, hello, my name is Simon Davis, co-founder of Nimbus Maps and welcome to today's webinar where we'll be talking about the new class MA permissive development rights coming into effect on the 1st of, October, of August. Sorry. And specifically we want to talk about uh, how does a savvy property entrepreneur put the theory into practice and crucially uh, how do you find some great opportunities where this can be applied. So to help me with that uh, I've invited on our guest speaker, Ranjan Bhattacharya, and also my colleague, Joe Johnson from Nimbus Maps. Ranjan is not only a successful real estate entrepreneur investing in and developing residential commercial properties for the last 30 years, but he's also a property mentor, author, property YouTuber, and TV personality. And some of you may recognize him from the Property Elevator series. Hi, Ranjan, how are you? Can you Hi. Yes, loud and clear. Good to uh, good to be invited back to to talk about Class MA. Very very exciting stuff. Can you see me? Okay. 
We can't actually, Ranjan, no. Um, okay, we'll just try to address that. Can you hear me, Joe? Yes, I can hear. Unless you're sitting in the dark, Ranjan, then it's, it's perfect. <laughs> no, I'm not sitting in the dark, but you can hear me okay, yeah? We can hear you fine. Okay, let's try to get a, let's try to get a visual. And, uh... Joe, I can't hear you. Can you hear me? I can't hear Can you hear Joe? I can't. Joe, I can hear you, sorry. Ranjo, can you hear us? Uh, I can hear everybody. We can't see you. Yeah, we should have a visual. Right. <laughs> There we go. Hang on, I was just looking blue there. What happened? <laughs> Have you seen this? I that is amazing. I I mean, um, this is Avatar uh, two or something. The movie. So, Ranjan, how are you doing? Uh, very very well. Okay, you look like a Smurf, don't you? But anyway, I do. Yeah, yeah. As I was saying, something out of that movie, Avatar. Uh, yeah. but I'm not seven foot tall. Um, do you know how we can clear that image? Okay, we're just uh, playing around with that, but we should have it fixed pretty soon. Okay, cool. Okay, and of course, Joe, who is our sales manager here at Nimbus Maps, I'm responsible for helping customers get the most out of our services. Joe, how are you? Uh, I'm absolutely brilliant. Thank you so much. I see some familiar names, which may have had some uh, chats with me in the past uh, and some new ones as well. So looking forward to sharing about uh, how Nimbus okay. can, can help as well. Cool. Well, it's not, uh, yeah. you have a few glitches on these webinars. Okay, okay so let's get started and to know our guest speaker a little bit. Ranjan, are you okay to, are you okay now? Yes, yes. Cool. So a little, little teaser to start with, just, uh, so Ranjan, just tell us, why do you do what you do? Why do I do what I do? Well, I do what I do in terms of commercial property. Um, I've been doing residential property for a long time. I started my journey with that. But commercial property, I think, offers the real um, uh, playing field, and I mean playing field, to be creative and entrepreneurial in a way that residential property doesn't. Um, and I love sharing that with, uh, with others and helping people kind of implement my strategies and through Property Elevator and also um, through uh, our business. We also invest in people's deals uh, when, when they have done creative deals and generated so much equity. Of course, we'll, we'll come in and, and, and JV with people. So it's very, very powerful. It's, it's doing um, uh, something which is incredibly creative and entrepreneurial and I'll come on to why that is the case with commercial property it's sharing with others uh, my passion and helping them implement it but it's also uh, investing and JVing with people um, to, 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 to help them actually uh, do the kind of stuff that I do in other parts of the country um, so it's all encompassing really why I do what I do it's just great fun Perfect. And you can't be that, can you? Fun. Fun is what right, gets out of bed in the morning. So do you want to start sharing your screen and perhaps run through your uh, your slides? Yes, and, and I okay. will. Let me just, uh, oops, do that right now. Uh, it says, um, I cannot share a screen because you you're not, sharing yeah. one. Hang on one second. Share screen. Got my some slides that I prepared earlier. Perfect. And uh, so um, I've got about 20 minutes, have I? Yes. To give right. people a whistle stop tour through MA. Um, what does MA stand for? It actually stands for Mercantile to Abode. I think someone with a uh, I don't know, went to, uh, universe, went, went to Oxford University and did Latin come up with the name for these, um, uh, these, these uh, PD classes, but that's why it's called MA. Who the hell uses mercantile to abode? But basically, mercantile is commercial to residential. I don't know why they didn't say that. They could have called it class CR. It would have been far more intuitive, but you know, there it is. Um, so what class MA does, it allows a whole bunch of commercial properties to be easily repurposed to residential use. Um, it allows more um, commercial properties than ever before to be repurposed, much more than under the old rules. And it replaces um, the old rules, 
which were things like class O, class M and class G, uh, which expire on the 31st of July. So these rules were announced, class MA was announced on the 31st of March. Uh, and they've told us what these are all about. They don't come into effect until 1st of August. So we've got plenty of time to kind of prepare, get our ducks in a row, uh, figure, figure out where the opportunities are and um, what sort of deals that you, you want to start looking for now in advance of the 1st of August so that you kind of get yourself ready for, for, for all of that. So that's what I'm going to share with you guys today, a little bit of a whistle-stop tour uh, through Class MA. Hopefully we'll take some questions and uh, obviously look at how Nimbus Maps can help source these opportunities as well, um, which Joe will be looking at afterwards. Um, so for those who um, are thinking, who the hell is this guy and why have they got him on and what's he all about? Um, I started investing in property back in 1990. Um, I did a computer science degree management consultancy career for a good decade. I invested all the way through the 1990s. Uh, I went full-time in property in 2001. And in commercial property, I started investing in commercial property from 2001 as well. So I've been doing that for about 20 years. Um, I am basically an investor and developer. We invest, develop properties. We mainly hold the properties that we develop for long-term rental yield. Uh, we operate in North London and also the uh, commuter towns uh, surrounding the M25. Um, you probably have uh, may have seen me sort of speaking on various topics. You may have uh, come across my uh, YouTube channel. You may have seen me on Property Elevator, which is a Dragon's Den style pitch show on Sky. We uh, series two of Property Elevator. All the pitches are available to watch on our website, succeedingproperty.com forward slash elevator. Uh, it's a great watch because um, it's a lot of learning. Loads of the deals that were pitched on the Series 2 were actually commercial to residential deals. Um, again, because they offer the most creativity, they offer the most equity uplift. In other words, you build in uh, wealth, instant uh, equity into the deals that you do simply by converting from cheap commercial space into relatively high price residential space. And therefore, those sort of deals are... Um, very, very easy to raise finance for because when there's basically there's something in it, it's not that difficult to find people that want to back you. So, so many of the deals um, in series two were actually commercial to resis. So I advise everyone to kind of watch that, uh, watch those pitches uh, to see what they can learn uh, from that. Uh, the version that we have on my website, we've got, um, I, I do a little bit of um, uh, analysis, a uh, kind of, um, uh, extra analysis on the on what was televised on the Sky Channel. So it's an interesting sort of learning and edu edu educational kind of watch as well. Series three, we're filming series three in beginning of July. So if you've got a deal and you're looking for funding, just get in touch. I'll get you in touch with the producers and you can apply to be on series three of Property Elevator, which is coming uh, shortly, filming in July, early July. Um, we do, I do all sorts of stuff in commercial property, the other residential property as well. The other thing we do is we run a serviced office business. Uh, our first serviced office center is in St. Albans, home to about 45 um, businesses, co-working desks, uh, meeting room hire, suites, all that sort of uh, stuff is, is what we do as well. Uh, you can contact me on my, on social media. Uh, and if you're not already a subscriber on YouTube, get on there. Uh, we're close to 40,000 subscribers, new videos every week, all about keeping you on top of uh, property, um, uh, property investing. Now, we're talking about Class MA. PD has got a long history, and I've got a, quite a long history in doing commercial to residential conversions. Uh, my first commercial to residential conversion was actually in 2006, which was seven years before any PD was introduced. And that was done the hard way. That was done under full planning permission. Planning permission is a pain in the backside, quite frankly, um, to use a technical phrase. Um, there's too much opportunity for Jobsworth in the council to wave their clipboards about and say, no, you can't do that, mate. Um, and I don't like that. Central government don't like that. And that's why they've introduced PD rights. PD rights say, well, OK, we accept that the planning permission process is slow. We're going to say there are things that you can do to property without having to go through the 
um, convoluted planning process, uh, you have a right to develop uh, in this way. These development rights are permitted. That's what it means. Um, and provided you've, your development uh, uh, um, meets certain criteria, which are predefined, then you will get the permission to go ahead. Now that is completely unlike the vagaries of planning permission when it could be so up to what an individual planning officer thinks it's appropriate. Um, and they come up with all sorts of rubbish reasons for rejecting stuff. And some people are lucky enough to get planning permission in eight weeks. Some people it takes two, three years or some people it's through lengthy appeals. And the problem with that sort of planning system is smaller developers and investors cannot get funding for uncertainty. With permitted development, if you know your permitted development rights inside out, you know that there's a predefined checklist or template that your development has to fit. And provided you fit those criteria, you're pretty much good to go. You can rock on and develop. And also there's something called, um, there's a consent period. In other words, they, the, the authority have to kind of, um, uh, they only have 56 days to look over your prior approval application for permitted development. And if they don't respond in a certain time period, you're good to go anyway. So what, what all this means is that for smaller developers, um, because of the squashed time frame and the, and the increased certainty behind the prior approval process, um, you can get funding, you can do things with a lot more certainty, and you don't have to go through the vagaries of planning permission as I had to do back in the old days from 2006 onwards. In 2013, they, they brought about the first round of uh, permitted development rights, which allowed conversion, which allowed conversion of certain types of commercial properties into um, residential use. And these were things like offices and what were called A1 shops and A2 buildings, such as banks, building societies, estate agents and the like. Um, now, this has just gone big, quite frankly, um, they have, they're going to retire those old permitted development rights, which were introduced in 2013. They retire on the 31st of July this year, and they're going to be replaced by some new ones. Now, what are all those about? The, the, the new ones is Class MA, which is what I'm going to talk about today. And Class MA, Mercantile to Abode, allows you to convert any class E property into residential use, either fully or partially. Now, what are class E properties? Class E is a brand new usage class that was brought in on September the 1st, 2020. Now, this is confusing. And, and you know, where there's confusing stuff, if you just figure it out, there's loads of opportunity. Um, we use classes meaning to, to refer to the types of buildings or the types of commercial uses that properties uh, can be um, given. We also use classes to identify the different things that you're permitted to do to those building types. So I don't know why the government have done that, but they just have. So you've got usage classes, which are the commercial uses that a building can be put to. And we've got permitted development classes, which define what you can do to those buildings. So once you get through that confusion, it really helps you kind of understand uh, kind of what we're talking about when we talk about permitted development. So what they've done on 1st of September, they've said all these old building types, we're going to roll into this mega usage class E. Mega is my word, by the way, the government just call it class E. I put out a YouTube video on this last year explaining what that was all about. That's worth a watch. Um, but what it does is it encompasses all, sh all shops, which used to be A1, all banks, building societies, and estate agents, which used to be A2, all restaurants and cafes, which used to be A3, all B1 offices, all the um, uh, clinics and healthcare centers, day nurseries and the like, which used to be D1 and gyms and indoor recreation centers, which used to be D2. And they've put them all in this usage class E. And this is massive, by the way, because uh, before September last year, if you wanted to make a shop, a newsagent shop into a restaurant, you'd have to apply for planning permission. 
Now, because it's under one usage class, you're good to go. You don't have to ask anyone's permission. And that is repurposing commercial buildings to alternative commercial uses. So that already is here. The thing is, on September the 1st, Class E was a bit of a shock. You know, it was just announced pretty much. And we had a few months to get to grips with it. And then bang, COVID lockdown. We couldn't do Zippo with commercial properties anyway. Now we emerge from the uh, depths of uh, lockdown uh, into a world where everything's open again. What we're going to see is the true power of repurposing commercial buildings to other commercial uses within class E is going to um, really, um, it, people are gonna see the benefits of this right now. And this is a great enabler. Um, so that's class E, but, but, but what they've also done is um, they've introduced this new PD right, as I said, called class MA. What's that about? Well, this basically says that they've announced it now, but from 1st of August this year, 2021, you can take any building on the left here, any building that's in class E and convert it fully or partially into residential use. Now, it's subject to some ifs and buts, and I'll share with you some of those so you can get an idea of uh, what it's all about. So there's a maximum building size. There's a maximum building size of 1,500 square foot, which in all, 1,500 square meters, sorry, which in old money is roughly about 16,000 square foot. So that's a pretty big building that you can now convert. Um, it's allowed in conservation areas, which is great. Um, some of the older PD rights weren't allowed in conservation areas, some are, but the whole of MA, conservation areas, you're good to go. There's no issue with um, dwelling mix. Now, if I apply to build a block of flats under planning permission, the council will have their say on the dwelling mix that I can build. So they'll say, oh, we want a couple of three bed units, we want a couple of two bed units, a couple of one bed units. Under PD, if you've decided that for your market, you want to build all studios or all one beds or all two bed flats, then you can choose the dwelling mix that you want to build, which is great. Um, there is a minimum dwelling size consideration. So for a one person occupation flat, one bedroom flat, it's 37 square meters is the minimum size. You do have to demonstrate that habitable rooms have natural light. So we're there, we're talking about lounges and bedrooms need to have decent windows basically. And, and no external alterations to the external envelope of the building are allowed under, um, uh, under class MA. If you want to punch in extra windows or doors to make the uh, layout work best, you will have to do that under a separate planning permission. Now, to me, this makes sense because this allows, because you're not making any alterations to the external envelope, that's pretty much why you can do this in the conservation area without too much opposition. Now, um, I'm doing a whistle stop tour through some of the facts here. Um, and, and I've got a lot of case studies as well. And I'm doing a webinar, which is free this Sunday. It's 90 minutes full of case studies and how you can exploit some of the entrepreneurial advantages. You can register for that. It's property-workshop.com. We'll be going through a lot more about this with a lot more case studies uh, than I've got time to do at the moment. But uh, do register for that free webinar on Sunday. A um, couple of conditions. Um, listed buildings, I wouldn't bother about listed buildings anyway. It's too much time, hassle, expense, sometimes converting some of those. They will look at transport impacts of making a commercial building residential in a particular area. Um, they will look at... Um, the neighboring commercial, if you're making new residential units where none existed previously in that out of a commercial space, they will look at the noise impact of neighboring commercial units on the future residential occupiers of your building. So for example, if there's a noisy nightclub next door, then you'd have to um, put in place sound noise mitigation measures to make sure that your residents wouldn't be affected by that noise. Um, now, because you're going to be allowed to convert things like dentist surgeries and um, doctor surgeries and uh, registered nurser nurseries, 
if they are registered NHS or registered nursery type of um, buildings, then you will have to demonstrate that there's no demand for that building, for that usage in that area. And that's often some kind of marketing test. So you'd have to demonstrate it's been marketed for a period uh, before you'd be allowed to convert those. But that shouldn't be um, a big deal because most of the buildings are just old and unfit for purpose. And that's why um, things like DP surgeries are moved to more modern premises. Now, one of the interesting things about this when we talk about shops and uppers, and again, I've got plenty of examples of shops and uppers in the, in the webinar this Sunday, um, is that if it's not a conservation area, you, are, you will be allowed, there'll be no resistance or there'll be no way the council will be able to stop you from converting the whole of the retail space on the ground floor to residential use, which is quite amazing really. Now, I'm not saying you would want to, I actually believe it's actually good to maintain a smaller commercial unit on the ground floor in most areas. Um, but under this PD, class MA, you can do that. If you're in a conservation area, um, they would want to look at what losing the ground floor retail space, what impact that would have on the conservation area and the vibe of that conservation neighborhood. And a way around that would be simply to just maintain a viable shop at the front and make flats um, at the rear of the premises. Uh, so that's one issue with a conservation area, but in non-conservation areas, if you want to, you can convert the whole retail premises into um, uh, uh, residential use. Um, they, they have introduced a few more conditions. Again, I'll kind of whistle stop through some of them in the time we've got left. Um, three months vacancy test. Um, I think one of the big criticisms with the existing PD that's been on the table was that I can apply for PD for an office to residential conversion. The office can be tenanted. As soon as I get my PD, I can throw out the tenants and, uh, and do my conversion. They don't want that anymore. They don't want businesses to be displaced by greedy developers like you. So what you have to do is you can only um, uh, apply for class MA conversion if the property has been vacant for three months. Now, um, that means that you're gonna up your game with uh, when you're dealing with vendors in terms of structuring conditional offers uh, using things like option agreements and the like uh, to structure an offer um, so that you can basically introduce some conditionality into your offer so that you can navigate your way around that three month vacancy test. I'll be talking more about that on, uh, on, on, on Sunday uh, as, as well. Um, the other, inter some interesting things that have um, uh, come out of this class MA is um, more buildings. But not only you know, can you do things like A3 restaurants and GPs and um, uh, gyms and stuff like that, which you couldn't do under previous um, PD, but you can also do um, new, newer buildings because under some of the old PD rules, it was time stamped. Uh, the building had to be in office use, for example, at 2013. Now what they've done is they've said it's a, it's a rolling two year time stamp. So if you want to convert an office, it needed to be used as an office for the last two years. So that suddenly means that buildings, newer office buildings built between 2013 and to 2019 can now be converted to residential use. And guess what? Newer buildings, because they're newer and they build to more modern building regulations, they're easier and cheaper to convert to residential. So those buildings were, were no-go buildings before, they're now good to go. There were a few um, obnoxious councils uh, that introduced um, Article 4s, which prevented you from doing Class M, which was um, ground floor retail to residential conversion. Those Article 4s are scrapped. So if you're, in, if you're looking at any shops in an in a Article M, sorry, in an Article 4 area that prevents class, the old Class M, from August the 1st, whack in your application, you're good to go. Um, the other thing that's this brought in is um, we had a something called Class G in the old days, which allowed two shops, sorry, two flats to be made above a shop. Now that presented certain anomalies. If you have one floor above a shop 
under class G, you could do two flats. If I have five floors above a shop, I can still only make two flats. Now they've done away with class G, under class MA, I can convert as many floors as I like above a shop into residential, up to a maximum of 16,000 square foot, as long as each one is 37 square meters minimum, I've got natural light everywhere, I can have as many flats as I like, which is very, very interesting. And also it brings into play some basements and a lot of basements are quite well lit. We've got a property um, which we will be looking at doing as soon as MA comes out, where um, it's from the ground floor, from the front of the shop, um, there's a basement. But because the land slopes away at the rear, the basement is, on, is level with the ground, it's level with the garden because the land slopes away. So we have a basement with full natural light, which is, which, is, uh, which is plenty enough to build two flats, basically, in that basement. So under the old PD rules, there was no PD for doing that. Under the new rules, provided um, it's in a sort of retail building, provided uh, you can have natural light, provided each flat is 37 square meters, you can have as many of them as you like, up to the upper limit of 1500 square meters phenomenal enabler. It actually brings many, many more building types um, into play, which previously you couldn't do. Um, I'm running out of time. I'm going to, I'll cover a lot more case studies um, when we, uh, when we do the webinar on Sunday, uh, which is free. It's a 90 minute webinar, um, plenty of case studies. Um, but this is one of our deals, which we have done actually uh, this year. We completed on this in, um, uh, I think it was the 3rd of February this year, and it was bought at auction. It was bought at the Barnet Ross auction. Uh, the reason I say that is because um, the thing with commercial property is they're all around the place. These sort of deals and opportunities are all around the place. The problem is that most people do not know what they're looking for. They do not have imprinted in their head a requirements list a requirements list of what to go looking for. The requirements list is, is a mixture of what your investment strategy is, if you like, and what your end game is, and also your knowledge of permitted development rights. The permitted development rights that I've talked about today, you need to know inside out. You need to know um, what the opportunities are from each one of those PD, uh, PD rights, what the angles are, um, what the types of and, and drill it down to property types that you need to go hunting for because very few people know this stuff this is not common knowledge um, so that's really what I kind of kind of talk about I'll share more on, on on Sunday but this building was bought at auction that means anyone could have had it it was Barnet Ross auction anyone else could have seen this property anyone else could have done this deal um, it just whether people knew the stuff so what we are looking at here is um, it's a freehold building. It's two shops on the ground floor, which are, which are trading and rented out. The above space is four, uh, sorry, is an office space. It's an old office above, a sho above shops, which is um, accessed from the rear. The beauty of this deal is that um, based on the purchase price, it generates just from the rent of the shops below, it generates five and a half percent yield from day one. Um, what we have applied for is permitted development rights to convert the above space into four one bedroom apartments. Now, the beauty of this deal, of course, is we can make the four one bedroom apartments above um, without impacting the shops below. We've got separate access from behind. The whole development, this is a development project which is earning five and a, it's earning cash flow simply because the ground floor is fully let. Um, which is kind of like the holy grail of any development project to actually develop something, but actually have some income from that site at the same time is, is, something, is something rather special. So we're making four one bedroom flats here. And, uh, and basically um, there is a just over a 500,000 um, pounds of uplift, of, of value that's created in this deal. Why is that? Well, it's quite simple. You take commercial space, you take commercial space, particularly this office space. No one wants to be in an office building above these, the, in a pokey office um, space above a couple of shops in a high street. 
they want to be in a modern serviced office building like what we have here, uh, like, what, like what we have in St Albans. Um, so the demand for offices has completely changed. These, this space is completely defunct. Now, as office space, it has a very, very low value per square foot. As residential space, it has a much higher value per square foot. So all you have to do is take this, is know how to find and what defunct commercial property space to look for and know, know whether you can convert it to residential and how to go about doing so. As soon as you've converted it to residential, it doesn't cost you that much in most cases to actually convert from commercial to residential. Um, in this case, the layout is actually pretty much what it needs to be um, for four one bedroom flats. And that's how you get that uplift. Now, on, on my YouTube channel, I talk a lot about the Brewer strategy, the buy, the refurbish, the rent out, the refinance and the repeat kind of strategy. Because the idea of that is you buy a property, you refurbish it to add huge value to the property, you rent it out to generate the cash flow. And then you, because you've enhanced the value of the property, you can refinance it at the end and pull out most or all of your money and then repeat the whole thing again on the next one. Commercial to residential conversion for a buy to let portfolio builder gives you the best opportunity to, to, to implement the Brewer strategy, recycling your cash, pulling out your money from each deal that you do. Because this deal is getting a 500K uplift, we will be able to refinance once it's built, built. At the moment, we've just got the, we've just um, had the nod from the council. This is very fresh. We're just doing this at the moment, only completed in February. We've had the nod from the council that we can, um, they're, they're, they're giving us the prior approval um, uh, for, the, for the four flats. So we're getting, getting going with that. But once it's done, um, we will be able to refinance the whole building at the higher value and basically um, the refinancing amount will allow us to pull us all our cash out the deal in order to, in order to go again. So uh, there are phenomenal opportunities up and down the country. And I love this case study because it's current, it's, it's bang on now, and it was at an auction. And you could have found this too. You could have done this deal too um, if you knew um, what to look for in those auction catalogs and when you're down, walking down streets and stuff like that. Many people um, listen to what I say and listen to my training on the subject and they find that they, they're in their hometown and they, they suddenly, their eyes are open to opportunities that they were walking by every day and only just figured out what the opportunity is and how to string it all together. So MA is exceptionally exciting. Um, there's a hell of a lot to it. You can do a lot more than you ever could to more building types. Um, and they've announced this. Uh, it doesn't come into force until 1st of August. The savvy folks are going to get clued up with this right now, and they're going to start looking for property opportunities right now and, and build and, and benefit from that first mover advantage. That's the thing. Because I tell you what, in, a, in, in give it a year or so, a lot more people will be aware of this stuff. A lot of vendors will be aware of the types of things that you can do. And uh, the real benefit whenever PD comes out is first mover advantage. If you want to benefit from that, come on my um, uh, free uh, webinar on Sunday. We'll go through a lot more case studies. And uh, I think I'm about done. Happy to take any questions. And of course, Nimbus is great for prospecting these opportunities. Well, thank you so much, Ranjit. So we'll, we'll go the, through the questions at the end, but I mean, just want to ask, so my look at this, it's a, it's a massive minefield, isn't it? Right here, right now. And does that mean there's a lot of uninformed property owners? Because you've said, historically, people have liked to do the sort of letter campaigning, finding sites that way off market, trying to sort of find that. But you, you just found one on an orchard. It's completely transparent. So do you think there's more opportunities out there because it's such a minefield and, and there's less, there's a lot of uninformed uh, property owners there right now. Absolutely. There's huge amount of, unin because it, here is the, um, you can see this is my copy of the uh, PD uh, uh, legislation that's been put out, heavily annotated and all that sort of stuff. But it's a relatively brief document. <clears throat> and that covers what you can do with a huge range of property types. So these rules apply to a restaurant, they apply to a gym and they apply to an office. 
but those are completely different types of buildings. So when you've got one set of rules that apply to so many building types, of, all, of course they're going to be anomalies uh, and opportunities from those anomalies, because it's impossible to come up with a coherent set of rules that applies to every if and but for all those different building types. Um, so, so it is about learning the, the nuances, the explicitly what you can and can't do, and how they apply to the range of properties that are out there. And it could be on market, it could be off market, it could, it could be, be off market. market. Yeah, exactly. And I think the um, it, it, they're available everywhere. Commercial agents, um, uh, auctions as well. I love auctions. The direct to vendor stuff is great because the thing with direct to vendor, uh, which is um, uh, is that many people got into commercial property for stable cash flow. So if you bought a bank building, you bought it as a long-term buy-to-let. You don't want to be bothered by it. You don't want to be doing anything about it. By it. You know Barclays is going to be in that building for, for years. They've been in there for 50, 60 years to date. They're going to keep renewing their lease and their regular pairs. Uh, betting shops, they used to be the same as well. You know, a lot of these people that used to be such surefire bets um, ain't good anymore. So if you are a um, just a commercial buy to let investor, you ain't interested in all this PD stuff, usually because you just own a port. You, you, that's not what you got into it for. And you often have a portfolio of properties geographically diverse, diverse uh, all over the country. And it's not your bag to manage refurbishment projects 300 miles away from where you live. So these sort of people are interested in selling up. You know, if you go around, you know, some simple things, for example, just use um, uh, things like Nimbus Maps and um, prospect for betting shops, betting shops which are owned by private individuals, because they will be worried. If you've got a betting shop let to coal, and there's two years left on the lease and you own it in your own name. What next after that? You know, we've got the um, coming of CGT. I mean, the, the, the government have said they've got to pay for all the help out to eat, eat out freebies they've given everyone. Uh, so they're going to do that by um, uh, walloping CGT on individual owners of properties. So if you have had a shop for 10 years and, and, you've experienced a little bit of capital gain. You own it in your own name. It's let to William Hill and you, um, their lease runs out in two years. Um, then they are worth prospecting because they will be worried. My stable cash flow is coming to an end. So the direct to vendor marketing, the success of that is knowing the game and knowing what the profile is of the owner that you're targeting. So what is the profile of the owner that, that you're targeting? What problem or headache are they about to have with this property? I mean, they, they and what opportunity is there for you? You could look on the charges register and, and, and worse still, they could have a loan to Barclays Bank and their, their income's coming drying up because the lease is coming to an end and then they're going to have the bank knocking exactly. on it. So exactly, exactly. So, so, so direct to vendor, you know, I don't think, I don't see an easy way of doing that without tools like Nimbus Maps to help you prospect. You come up with those scenarios of vendor types and circumstances and the buildings they're in. And then you use Nimbus Maps to obviously do the due diligence and prospect for them. Not maybe a nice segue to bring Joe in then, I would have thought, to just say uh, how we can, a few tips and tricks on how to um, to sort of find these sites. So again, we'll, we'll take questions at the end. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll do that at the end. Then we'll, we'll also put the links into Ranjan's, your your event on Sunday, isn't it, at seven o'clock? But we'll, we'll send you all those links out. But maybe, Joe, you could perhaps uh, pick up the, the, um, some of the, the ways to find some of these sites. These yeah, ones. fantastic. So, Ranjan, if you could stop sharing your screen and I'll share mine, uh, if that's okay. Yeah, perfect. done. There we go. And there we are. So, perfect. So, should see uh, all of that now. So, um, yeah, that was fantastic, actually, Ranjan. Uh, that's really good. And obviously, a lot of stuff that you've mentioned there, Nimbus, 
um, uh, can help uh, in that instance as well. So um, obviously uh, I would hope uh, quite a lot of people are familiar with kind of Nimbus uh, already, but with Nimbus, uh, there is actually eight ways to find sites um, and they're all listed for you here. Uh, you're not supposed to know or necessarily understand all of these. Obviously, as Ranjan's mentioned, uh, obviously having that knowledge is key in, in terms of what we're talking about here today. Um, but just like Ranjan as well with his webinar on Sunday, we train you on those to get you up and running with our software. That's via our customer success teams uh, and our monthly trainers uh, with uh, co-founder, which are incredibly, incredibly popular um, as well. But the important thing to know is that there are loads and loads of ways to get the results you want to achieve. Uh, and actually with Nimbus, it got that little bit easier as well with our Elite Plus strategies as well. Uh, Elite Plus, we're not going to go into too much detail about Elite Plus today, but Elite Plus is another um, uh, uh, product that we offer, which essentially turbocharges your site finding, identifying opportunities that meet your strategic needs. Uh, they plot them uh, within the platform to easily access the latest opportunities, making it uh, effortless uh, to uncover sites brought about by changes to things like PD rights, shops with uppers, commercial conversions, um, and obviously a lot more what you can see here. But for now, uh, I'm going to show you uh, just a few features in Nimbus Maps that will make your life that much easier when searching for these Class MA sites that you can access right away if you wanted to. So the first ones uh, with that are going to be things like um, uh, uh, the details that we've got here. So first and foremost, those types of buildings that we're actually looking for, those offices, industrial, retail. We've also got that functionality of, for, to look for things like betting shops, um, all that as well. So this is actually a screenshot of my results here. So we have a, a section in Nimbus where you can go into your filters. You tell us exactly the kind of sites you actually want to go and find. We plot them on the map. And what we've done is we've actually clicked on one of them here and it's pulled out this panel um, for us here as well. Now, this is a snapshot of some of the information that you're going to get out of uh, Nimbus. But interestingly enough, obviously, you've got ownership detail all at your fingertips. So you've got things like the name of the company. You've got their link through to companies, how see who those decision makers are uh, there as well. You can search company properties. So with Nimbus, you can actually plot what a company owns. You can take that data out of the platform if you wanted to as well and get good information like leases um, as well. And additional information is you've got kind of a box like this where you've got 80 properties sold in the last 18 months. Is that company actually in selling mode? Um, it's well, a very good indicator for that. These other ones here are really to search for contacts is going to tell you whether they've instructed any agents to selling of their sites. We're going to talk about availability in a moment as well. Uh, it's also going to tell you what planning applications they've gone in for, not just for this site, but any other sites that they've got. It's also going to tell you if they've announced any closures within the media as well. So you've got a lot of tools uh, in terms of ownership uh, and detail there as well. Now, another, uh, whoops, I missed one, skip one there. Uh, another very handy um, uh, detail that we've touched on a little bit here as well is that, that availability in Nimbus. So what we do at Nimbus is that we go off uh, and we go and find what is actually on the market right now. You can use that with things like filters and then put something like our availability overlay that you've got on here to actually go and see whether there's a site on the market like this one here. Not only is it going to give you all that detail, what the building looks like, it's all pulled from the, uh, the agent's website. It gives you a link to go and check that out. And these are updated every single evening for you. So you can be sure that you're not going to go in and it's already kind of gone or whatever like that. It's going to be um, all up to date for you. So straight away, not only are we identifying sites that we actually want to see, but we're also identifying um, other uh, uh, opportunities that are actually already um, on the market for us there as well. So straight away, um, it's very, very quick and easy to do that with Nimbus. And then, of course, once we've uh, sort of had a look for our sites, we've done our prospecting, we've, uh, we've had a look around, that is when we're going to dig a bit deeper, um, uh, deeper sorry, into our research elements. So we want to be checking the building's meet conditions for Class MA. Now, via that information panel, you're going to have a lot of this information there already, but this is merely now visual representations to say, look, is that site in a flood zone? Is there a listed building? Is it sitting in an area of outstanding natural beauty, SSIs or special protection areas? 
are plenty more like conservation areas that we mentioned before um, uh, and other planning overlays as well. But this is merely an example to show you that we can tell you exactly that it is going to uh, meet the conditions for that class MA um, for you there as well. And then the other elements of that and more research is that Nimbus gives you the whole uh, snapshot. It gives you the whole picture because we hold commercial and residential data. So you can say to Nimbus, go and find me all those commercial properties that have sold in the last three years or longer if you wanted to, because we've got data that stretches back um, to 95. Um, and essentially this is a search that I've done here. It's showing me all these commercial properties um, that are actually on the market. Um, sorry, that have sold in the last three years. Uh, which I can click into and get the details of those. And it's showing me with my availability marker what's on the market right now. So what's the building actually worth? We can work that out very, very quickly uh, as well. F fantastic. So what you can also do uh, is that you can actually do the same with residential data. Looks exactly the same. Uh, again, I've done a residential search here, showing me all those residential sites. It's all interactive. Uh, I can go and click and see the details in that panel again and go and say, well, actually, yeah, this sold in X date for this amount um, as well. But actually what I'll be sharing with you on Friday is quite kind of a live example of all of this. And what's very cool with Nimbus is once again, just like that company um, uh, export, you can take everything you see on the map into your things like Excel spreadsheets and have it all in one place um, for you there as well. And essentially, this is what that would actually look like. So you've got things like the address, of course, but most critically, you've got that price paid, date that it's sold, you've got your sizes and rates per square foot, very good for kind of getting those averages there as well. You've got links back into uh, uh, Nimbus if you did want to go and look at these sites back in platform, but you've also got your links through to Rightmove. So if you do want to check out the particulars or, or anything like that, you've got every bit of available resource to be completely in the know um, there as well. Now, the other ways uh, that are very good uh, in Nimbus in terms of Class A is uh, looking at previous Class A applications. So what you can do with Nimbus is you can go off to the planning portals uh, and you can uh, filter off just the applications you're interested in. You can do that by authority. You can do it by keywords. You can actually filter it down even before you get to this stage by status, date, uh, and unit size if you wanted to as well. Again, it's merely saving you that time and putting it all into one place for you. So what we're looking at here is you've got kind of the link through to the actual application. This is all those planning applications that will meet your criteria within that uh, uh, export that you're looking to do. You've got the status of the application, the dates, you've got links back into Nimbus. But what we do in this planning export is also give you that little bit more data as well. And what I mean by that is it's going to show you things like, uh, is it already in commercial ownership? Uh, what's their address? When have they bought this site? How much do they purchase it for? But we're also going to pull through details like the applicant's uh, name. We're going to pull through their address. And interestingly enough, we'll also pull through things like the agent's name, architects, planning consultants. Why is that particularly interesting? It's because um, uh, what you can do, because these are your Excels to do exactly what you'd want with, but you can filter off these. And then you can say, well, actually, uh, who are the most prominent agents or uh, design teams that I need in my team um, to deal with uh, my planning applications um, there as well. So it's about building um, that right team for you there as well. And then the final thing really is that not only is Nimbus a fantastic way of finding sites through our multiple ways, uh, researching all those elements, looking at those conditions, looking um, at, at those values, but it's also a great place to kind of uh, uh, and keep uh, track of all those sites and get to that end game of things like going to uh, direct to vendor. So we have a really great system in Nimbus called Workflow. And Workflow is where you save your favorite sites. It's where you manage your own individual pipeline. So you would actually design this uh, by clicking add stage. You can kind of move it all down the uh, pipelines there as well. You can make notes, but the very, very interesting thing that you can do is that you can bulk download your registers um, uh, if you needed to here as well. And that's by those three dots. And the reason I say that isn't just for convenience, it's also because if you download this as an Excel spreadsheet again, and you've got the register if it's in that commercial ownership, we'll pop all the owner's details in there for you, meaning 
If you are doing direct to vendor letter campaigning, you can send those letters out via mail merge or for that scale, we give to companies like UK Mail, get those to, then to send the letters out for you. You manage those inbound replies as well. And it's testament to Nimbus, not only uh, looking at that front end, but also going all the way through to Zed um, as well. So those uh, are really uh, an overview of uh, uh, the key features I think that are relevant to um, uh, Class MA. On Friday, uh, what we'll be doing is we'll be going through this in a live demonstration. But I urge you before then, um, do take a 14 day free trial. Everything I've shown you here today, you can go and use as soon as this is over um, if you wanted to. And I suggest you do so not only for that before that session on Friday, but also before uh, Ranjan's se uh, session on the Sunday there as well. So as mentioned, the introduction to Nimbus Maps Elite is 11 o'clock uh, on Friday, um, and that'll be with myself and my colleague, Andrew, that some of you have probably seen before, um, and uh, we'll take you through a live demonstration how we can put everything you've learned here today uh, using uh, Nimbus Maps um, there as well. And with that, pretty much is an, an overview there as well. Rancho, I don't want to throw back to you there just to uh, talk a little bit about your webinar on Sunday as well. Yes, I am. Um, uh, yes, I was just typing in some of some answers to questions. People have left loads of questions <laughs> in the uh, in the little chat. So I've been uh, type hammering in some answers to uh, to people there. Some great questions. Yes, on Sunday, uh, seven p.m. Uh, make sure you sign up. Um, it's completely free. Ninety minutes. We'll be going through with a lot more case studies, really, because I think the um, what I've talked about today is a whistle stop tour through some of the rules, but they really come to life when you see some case studies of how they're actually applied and the type of building types that they are applied to, because that's the information that you can actually use to kind of kind of equip yourself to go, go, go shopping, go hunting for some of these um, deals that are out there. So that's at seven. Uh, it's property-workshop.com is the register do they have the um yeah, the... so I, I think so Ranjan, we, i mean yeah I, and thank you very much joe as well and what we'll we'll do is we'll, we'll i'll pop a quick question uh, there's a quick question uh, now that we can pop up a poll if i just do that they can people can say if they want a bit more information we'll send it out directly to them if that's if that's okay so if i just launch that now and if, if people say yes they want to be contacted about Friday uh, with Joe, and I'd go into more detail, uh, certainly with you, Ranjan. Uh, I'll just put that on now, um, and then hopefully everybody can see that. So if they just uh, click yes or no on those three questions, then we can certainly make sure that they're fully informed of, of everything that um, that's going on, on on Friday and Sunday. Um, if that's okay, we'll leave that there for a, a few minutes. Um, it seems fairly popular, doesn't it? So. So really what we're saying is we've had a bit of a flavour from you, Ranjan, but there's an awful lot more. The devil's in the detail, isn't it, around this and the case studies will really draw out those cracking opportunities for people to go and start searching for. Yes, it's the opportunities. The opportunities are in the detail. So the um, like dealing with the three, if you are buying a property or if you're looking to buy a property of a vendor and it's currently tenanted, navigating your way around the three month vacancy test. Uh, is an issue, uh, which is doable, but you know you just have to know how you're going to do that. And um, if you are looking at a property where you know it will make a decent residential conversion, but it just doesn't have enough windows in the right places, so you're going to have to kind of sequence the way you do things a little bit to make sure you get per planning permission to punch those windows in first before doing the. Um, prior approval, class MA to convert to residential. So you do have to um, um, know how to, it's like each thing in the PD um, is sometimes an opportunity, sometimes it's a restriction which may put some people off, but if you know how to work around them and how to make it work for you, then you are kind of playing in a game where a lot of people are going to be put off by a couple of things that I've just mentioned uh, there. But they're not insurmountable, so. No. Perfect. Well, no. I'm just going, to, um, just going to close that that poll down. That's brilliant. Thanks ever so much for, for those that have answered that. Um, 
So what I was going to do now is we'll, we'll just open up the uh, open up to the floor, the virtual floor. We've got. To, if anybody wants to, to ask a question, if I could just ask you to raise your hand, and then I can uh, I can bring you in, and uh, you can you can ask your question. So I have uh, Ravi. Um, I'm going to hopefully make this work and allow you to talk and ask your question to uh, to us. Let's see if that works. Ravi, can you hear us? Can you unmute? Ravi. No, this is where, Ravi, can you hear us or not? No, okay, that one's not worked so well. So we've got Gerald Dale, so we, uh, can we ask him if he'd like to ask his question? Can you hear me? Yes, perfect. So we have planning permission on our site to build six houses and an office um, under the local council's um, uh, whatever it is, requirement. So uh, we don't want to build the office. Can, do we have to build the office and then convert it? Will that work? <laughs> the <ca> <laughs> so the council have not let you um, build all residential. They've made you build an office. Yes. Okay. Um, and, th and they've already given you that permission. Yes. Okay. So under the, under the new MA rules, um, you've got to build the six houses. Yes, you've got to build an office, office, but if you can bat it out for two years, then there's nothing they can do to, to, to stop you implementing class MA to convert that office into residential. So we'd have to leave it empty for two years? Um, well, you can try to rent it to someone. Someone might have it, but... Um, at a discount rate, but yes, under if they're not letting you make their office into residential under under planning permission, the way you can do that under PD is to wait two years because the new class MA just says that it needs to uh, have been an office for two previous years, which you ah, have. I see. Okay, it's a rolling right. time span. Yes. Then there's nothing they can do about it. So you'll have to work for your figures and see whether it's worth... Do you know what the uh, present values are versus the office values, Gerald? Or? Sorry? Do you know what the office values are versus the resi values in the, in the area? Yes, the office is worth about 250. The residential is worth about 650. <laughs> it might well be worth you um, doing a basic office, letting it out. I mean, how big, how many square foot is the office? Uh, about uh, 600 square feet, I think. Oh, relatively small then. Yeah. Yes. It's only... so it should be relatively straightforward to kit out and rent to someone for a couple of years. Yeah. On a on a license or something outside outside of the 1954 Act, and then um, and then then you're good to go as far as conversion. I've got you. Yes. Okay. About two hundred forty thousand, isn't there? For the difference in the price, that even at that. Oh point. yeah, yeah. It's enormous difference, obviously. Um, Okay, but um, it's uh, there's no way around it because it's part of the local council's uh, requirements. You have to have some uh, commercial element in all uh, because it was a commercial site originally. Does that make sense? Um, yeah, if that is in the planning permission for the, they haven't put it on the land registry D, um, the land registry in terms of any kind of restrictive covenant but if it's just in the planning permission that to implement your planning permission you just have to build six houses as an office then do it fully implement that permission then class ma says that as long as that office has been an office for two years you can convert okay so if that right. condition is just in your planning permission you're okay yes yes it is yeah that's it Okay. okay. Thank you. Thanks for your question, Joel. Um, so we've got um, Joe Mann. Can I, Joe, can we get you to ask your question? Yeah. Hi, everyone. Thank you very much. I'm really enjoying this. Um, I, I um, am in the process of buying a property, which I'm, I am going to then total split because the, there's an area at the back of it big enough for two four bedroom detached houses. They had planning permission all done, but it lapsed a couple of years ago. But 
if the planning permission was already there and everything, and I still want to go ahead with the original build and everything, every original specification of it, under permitted development, can I actually just build the properties or is there more that I've got to do? No, um, the, the permitted development doesn't apply to, to that because those uh, houses in the back were done under planning permission. So you would, because it's lapsed, you'd just have to reapply for that. Yeah. Um, and provided the, um, the 10 year local plan hasn't changed in the interim <laughs> period, um, you probably will be okay. Okay. Um, um, but there's, that doesn't, that's completely separate to PD. Yeah, I was just wondering if it could be used on it in some way, um, rather than going all through planning all over again. But uh, not to worry. No. Okay. All right, lovely. Thank you very much. Thanks, Joe. Thanks for your question. Um, we've got uh, Grace Southall. Can I be there? Hi. Yes. Um, thank you, Ranjan. Um, we were asking the question, do the upper floors have to have pre-existing separate access or will this work if the upper floors were previously used as retail storage? Yes. Yes. Uh, it, it, it's actually, um, um, well, yes. I mean, most of these sites do, uh, uh, the upper parts are connected in some way um, to the shop below. And, that, and so, that would come under permitted development? That comes under permitted development, yes. But if you have to change the shop font to provide an extra doorway, then that would be under um, planning permission. So would if that's exactly the unit that we're looking at, and previous to this um, webinar, we were looking at full uh, planning permission, um, there is possibility of access to the rear uh, but it would be onto a, a, a car park. Um, would it be worth going with permitted development and then perhaps putting in an application to change the front if it was possible to get access at the rear, but it would be ideal to, to get okay. it in the front? It's also it's, a conservation area. No, I get you. It's very hard to visualise, um, but um, for me to visualise. But generally speaking, the biggest prize of all is getting the permission for the principle of change of use to residential and getting the permission for a number of residential units. After that, any other modifications are relatively small beer. Uh, so that's what you've got to bear in mind. So um, what, I, what I always try to do and advocate for people is um, get the prior approval in just for that, to get the change of use established, the number of flats established, um, uh, uh, work the access for that prior approval using whatever existing access that you've got okay. um, and then do a separate planning a planning application for um, modification of a shop front you can modify unless you've got one of these charles dickens style picturesque victorian um sort of shop fonts with those little glass window panes where people sort of peer through yeah. and all of that um, uh, um, it doesn't mean that you can't modify a, co a conservation area shop front. There are usually stipulations that it has to be in timber and stuff like that. You can't use the trendy all glass and aluminium frame stuff, but you can ch make changes to a, to a conservation area shop front, but you do that afterwards by way of a separate planning application. So uh, we just put in one a few weeks ago where we got, uh, uh, sorry, we got it a few weeks ago where we established the principle for a couple of flats, but um, we just used the existing shop entrance door and then showed on the PD plan that we're that the, basically the shop entrance door stays and then we're making an inner lobby in which there's one door that goes to the shop and one door that goes to the flat. Right. Now, we're not going to build that. We're, okay. All we're using the PD for is to establish the principle that we've got two flats above. Then under a separate planning application, it will be we want to change the shop front to have an extra door. And that's not linked to the PD that we've done previously. That's just alteration of a shop front. And it's completely uncontentious. And it's very hard um, for, for anyone to object. Uh, the, the big prize is change of use. You get that done by whatever means, 
and then um so Rando, your advice is try and bank the optimum use structure and then go yes. to the devil of the detail and, yes. and thereafter so bank yes. you know bank the optimum use structure of the building to get that in i'd say in the bank and then and move on to the sort of yes. development control caveat though punching extra windows and doors above ground floor level in a conservation area will always be a problem at ground floor level probably not because above ground floor you've got overlooking issues but at ground floor level no under a separate planning app excellent so would this only be possible from august the first so if we're looking at that property now um, you, I haven't really covered it in this talk, but I will be covering it on Sunday. There are, um, you can use existing permitted development rights up until July the 31st. So as provided you get, because we've got some situations now where some buildings, it's advantageous to use the old rules and some it's advantageous to wait until August the 1st to use the new rules. So it may be that you want to get your PD in under the old rules. As long as you get your application in before 31st of July, um, it's in. And when you get your permission, you've got three years to complete it. Okay, th yeah, th this one's split, so it would be four flats. So my understanding would be that it would be better for us to wait until yeah. August. Yes, yes. Excellent. Thank you so much for your time. Appreciate it. Okay. No problem. Perfect. Um, so thanks, Grace. Uh, we have... Um, Jazz Somal is, uh, can you hear us okay, Jazz? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. All right, uh, great seminar guys, uh, really, really uh, informative. I'm asking this question, which is regarding the MA and the permitted development, what is the rules and criteria about parking in accessible locations? Because obviously a lot of places may have uh, additional land for parking, but some city centre locations may not have the parking provision. So what we look, what uh, investors would be looking to do is actually convert office buildings into residential. Now, will the local authorities ask for certain parking provisions? Um, they will take. Um... Uh, transport impact into account so they don't necessarily ask for parking provisions but they may want you to make it a car free uh, zone a uh, development so the Rickmansworth project that I um, mentioned um, because it's on a high street they can't actually um, make you provide car parking in that space because that, there's nothing in the PD that says that but what they're saying is they want us to enter into a um, section 106 agreement, which means that no one living in that property could apply for a car parking permit. So it doesn't matter, it's on the high street, plenty of buses, um, a tube nearby and all of that. So we're not bothered, that's fine. If they want to do that as a condition, that's fine. So that's more or less what they can do. Um, just say, look, um, we're not gonna let anyone have a car parking permit. Yeah, that, that, you've answered my question. I mean, I'm an ex-transport planner. I worked in the planning department with the local authority. Yeah, so they're asked for drink, green travel plans and uh, impact assessments as to the, the number of journeys that may or may not take place. But yeah, the key thing is where there is accessible locations like city centres, that there won't be a, there shouldn't really be an additional requirement as of this legislation. Uh, yeah. But it's... it's Yes, the types of um, impact assessments that you described are much more for planning, full planning applications. Um, and uh, they're not required in the same way for, um, for PD applications. But in the scenario where you've got the, was it 16,000 square feet uh, building? And let's just say, what, what's your rule of thumb if you were going for the minimum 37 square meters? How many flats could you ultimately get? Um, I, I haven't done that calculation Gen and so much depends on layout as a rough rule of thumb um, you need to allow whatever the square internal square footage is of the area um, 
You've certainly you've got to discount things like hallway. You've got to discount stair stairwell calls cores, which is you know not usable space. And then you should also discount about basically. I, I tend to allow for about ten percent of floor space, um, which is corridors and hallways, landings, and unusable space. So if you've got um, fifteen hundred square meters, discount discount ten percent for your communal areas. Um, the rest divide that by thirty seven and you've roughly got the uh, the number of flats. So if we were, I haven't got my calculator out, but if we just said that arbitrary 15 flats uh, and they needed a parking space each, you're looking at 15 potentially parking space. No, but they don't make you do that. They can't make you do that. But, yeah, that's my question. They, so under, if you're applying for the permitted development, they can't. Yeah. No. Even, even if you're outside an accessible location, like a, re, uh, a business park? Um, yes, that's true. Yes. There, there is no requirement to provide car parking. What they can do is prevent you applying for having residents apply for a car parking permit on the street. Yeah, but in the example, I'm, I suppose I'm citing an, another scenario is if you're in a... a, a a mixed use kind of industrial estate. Yes. And you got parking for 10 spaces, but you, but if you were to apply with the conventional planning route, you'd need parking for 20 spaces. Under permitted development, would you still be able to make that application? Yes. Yes. Because PD is different. Mm. Okay. PD is, is, is absolutely different. There are lots of, um, planning departments that seem to get a little bit confused as to um, I, I, about what they can and can't object to when it comes to PD. They seem to tweet, and here's a classic example. Um, most councils, when you do a prior approval application, they do a neighbor consultation. You know, they write letters to all the neighbors saying, do you want to object? Um, which is normal for a planning application. And, and in most boroughs, if you get two objections that it gets hauled into committee, there is no mechanism in PD for anything to be hauled into committee. And there's also no mechanism for considering anything that any neighbor says, unless the neighbor has something to say, which goes against the core of the PD criteria in this legislation. Um, there, there, is, there is nothing they can say that has any impact. So when they do neighborly consultations on PD applications, it just raises false expectations among neighbors that their views are going to be taken into account. Um, I did a, uh, we did an office to resi earlier this year in Gerard's Cross, and we had a whole bunch of neighbors um, um, moaning about um, this and that, about our convert, even moaning about the size of the bathrooms, um, you know, all sorts of rubbish. Uh, but they did the neighbourly consultation, but there's nothing in the prior approval legislation that says neighbour views are taken into account at all. They just do it. So I think right. some councils get a bit confused as to what is a PD and what is a full planning. Yeah. Ranjan, have you had experience where, in this scenario, where it's been prior approval and it's gone to planning committee? Say that again? where you've applied for a prior approval, um, but given- No, you can't. There is just can't. no mechanism for bringing it into committee. Committee is for planning applications. The thing with prior approval is to understand that this is, um, uh, um, this is permitted development. Um, all you're doing is, um, you're permitted to do this. Uh, all, you, all you have to do is give the council prior notification that you're going to do it. Uh, and the prior approval notice is to say, basically, this is my permitted development right. I fit all the criteria. Unless you disagree, we're good to go. And yeah. if they don't agree in 56 days, um, you're good to go with it. Okay, so on that um, note, can they put forward arguments like they have done in the past, like visual amenity, um, parking, road safety, you know, as you, as you said at the start of your presentation, there are planning officers that will just 
pull a, a rabbit out of the hat just because they don't like the development and it's quite arbitrary as what no the no because the the uh, um uh, for class ma what they can and can't consider is is all in all in this document here the um the legislation they can't bring in anything outside of that that's why it's so wonderful you know they do try uh but they can't i see it all the time where they you know within the the planning officer who who deals with the prior approval case they go they they just um you know they ask the highways guy for some sort of feedback they ask the environment guy for some feedback they ask all their departments for feedback and they give them all their feedback and they often write their feedback as though it's for a planning application. But at the end of the day, the planning officer is only legally able to consider certain criteria. And that's what's defined in the, in the prior approval um, MA uh, doc. And also this is true for the old ones. Uh, so there's nothing they can do. They don't like it, but there's nothing they can do. Yeah, I, I think it's really exciting. <laughs> given that uh, what, what you kind of presented, it's, uh, it's a really positive way forward to repurpose in buildings and, and do more development. So thank it's a, it's a, it's, yes, because so many of these things get snarled, uh, snarled up. And, you know, you have things like, um, you know, if, if, if in, because of the deemed consent thing, if they don't, um, if the council for whatever reason don't reach a decision in 56 days, you're good to go. Um, yeah, well, as we well know, councils are swamped with um, plenty of work anyway, so there's no, there's no, they've got no reason to withhold something that meets the criteria. Um, Ranjan, do you mind if we just take a couple more? Jazz, thank you so much. Thank you. Yes, yes. Can okay, we just take another couple of questions? Um, I've got uh, Martin Dale, do you, would you like to ask your question? Can you, are you still there? Can you hear me? Yes. Hi, Martin. How are you doing? Hello. Yeah, um, I'm a, a been a town planner for more years than I care to remember. And one of the key elements I find with the prior approval process, whether it's in relation to this or the other types, is the, the need to educate the planners as to what they're actually entitled to consider and how they yes. process the application. Uh, as I said, they, they, they have a tendency to forget that these are schemes for which planning permission has already been granted and that it's a case of assessing whether you meet the relevant criteria and conditions. So, for example, they shouldn't, they're not supposed to take into account whether you've got adequate parking provision, but they can take into account whether the increase in, whether the site is likely to result in an increase in traffic, which would cause a road safety issue. They're not entitled to take into account, except in circumstances, uh, circumstance, certain cases, um, the visual impact of the development, um, because that's not what we apply for, because any changes to the external of the building have to be subject to a separate planning application. So I find often it's a case of, if, you, if you're looking to move forward with this, get involved with somebody who understands the planning system and what they know and how the, it works and the quirks, and then get them to submit the application. I, I say I spend a lot of my time explaining to planners what they can and can't do at the beginning, and then progressing that through. And uh, one of the other key elements is, as I say, they consult the highways people, uh, they consult the, the flood people, and they come back with responses to planning applications, not prior approval yes. applications. So again, you have to get involved in that and, and point that out to them and push that forward. For example, we have, I've got a case at the moment where they're insisting on cycle stores being provided, uh, even though the sites and they've accepted the sites in a sustainable location. There's no there's no issues about additional vehicle movements. We're not being required to enter into a section 106 agreement. Now, I could turn around and say well, that's not actually relevant to the application, but it's easier to see if I can provide them with that than it is to argue with that. So it's a balancing act sometimes between them asking for things they're not supposed to, but is it easier to give them that than it is to argue? It depends on the scale and the impact of what's being proposed. But I would stress it's a convoluted and complex process, more than it needs to be. And I would always recommend you seek professional planning advice on these things. Yes. No, you nailed it. I mean, I think the, the, the issue, the, what I do is I kind of give people the entrepreneurial point of view. 
when you're actually submitting a prior approval, you do so with the help of a planning consultant. Um, a planning consultant who is versed with um, uh, uh, the whole process of applying for a prior approval is an essential part of your power team and you need to have that. I wouldn't do it on your own for the reasons that this gentleman just said. You do have to constantly educate them about what is prior approval and what isn't and play that play that sort of oh, balancing you're gonna have to act. Laminate yeah. that, that piece, that document in front of you, Ranja, and then you're gonna, you're gonna use it a fair few times to stick it in front of the planners uh, uh, no, under their noses, aren't you? Um, you do have to remind them of things. You do have to remind them of things. I mean, um, you know, exactly as I've forgotten the gentleman's name, um, with, our, with our recent one, we've got this thing where, um, you know, they are, they are they have technically not made a determination within the within the 56 days um so uh, technically we are good to go um but um they kind of responded after the determination date that they were happy with the um thing but they wanted to do a section 106 agreement to prevent occupiers having car parking spaces now because in that location um no one, none, no one living or renting that property would have a car anyway. So we're not bothered. So we're in this position now where 56 days have lapsed. We are technically, according to the legislation, good to go. But we don't have anything in writing to say that we're good to go. So the only way we can get through, get something in writing is to go through an appeal process to get it in writing, which will win instantly for non-determination. Or we can just roll with them and say, okay, we know you're over the 56 days, we'll accept your um, parking permit thingy and we'll get the piece of paper, which means we don't have to bother to go to get the piece of paper through by going through appeal. Having the piece of paper means refinancing. We've got, the, we've got it written down. But the legislation says we are good to go and no one can enforce against us because they haven't made the determination in 56 days. So as this gentleman rightly pointed out, these things are a balancing act. So you've got to have a planning consultant on. What I talk about is the entrepreneurial stuff. How do you find the opportunities to benefit from these rules? When you're ready to go with your application, don't do it DIY, don't do it with an architect, don't do it with someone who does drawings and um, plans do it with a planning consultant who is well-versed with prior approval. Uh, and I would point out, Ran, Janet, is that uh, obviously the planning export in Nimbus allows you to, to look for certain applications. You can see the, the agents that's attached to that planning application. You can obviously see their success rates as well. So if you're not familiar with a particular area, but the opportunity looks great. Yes. Use the planning export. I mean, Joe will show you this on Friday. Use the planning export. Find out which agents, i.e. not agents for the broker agents, but agents for the architects on the, or the planning consultants on the actual application. See who's successful and go and talk to one of those guys. The contact details yes. are on there. So yeah, don't, don't cut corners there, whatever you do. But, you know, as you say, find the opportunity. So. Thank you very much for your, your question, Martin. Uh, can I suggest we just take one more question because we're, we've got- Great uh, questions, by the way. It's been yeah. fantastic. Got a good bunch here. Uh, There's a lot, lot of them actually. So um, uh, should we just go for Ian Stamp? I think if he's still there, should we just, um, Ian, would you like to ask your question? Is Ian- Can you hear there? me? Yes, we can hear you, Ian. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's just uh, what, what you were um, saying. So, is it, it, your name Ranjan? I can't, yes. I'm not too sure yet. Just what you were saying, uh, Ranjan, about uh, parking. So, if, if I understand um, uh, your previous conversation with Martin, I think it was, then um, under PD, they, 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 um, they're not necessarily going to take parking into consideration. Um, the thing is that. Um, if if you, um, you know, build apartments or you know, convert them, uh, commercial to resi or whatever uh, apartments, and there's no parking, I mean, even in there, if they're in city centres, is that going to affect their saleability or, or not? It depends on the location, and it depends on what you build. And right. um, obviously, if you're trying to build three, four bedroom flats, then they'll be occupied by families and they'll want to have cars. But if you're building one beds studios. Then, and it's in a city centre location, then, then no. Right. I see. Yeah. Okay. Again, I'd suggest you look on, say, the comps 
schedule and see what the going rate per square foot of a one bedroom, two bedroom flat with and without car parking is and look for what's what's the going what's happening in the marketplace to be able to to build your comps and to build your confidence in that top line um, well, and see if there's a, a particular difference if it's if there aren't any or it's going to have a significant yeah. impact on the rate per foot it it may impact your uh, appraisal and, and your decisions and what you do but uh, i think you can you can inform yourself you can create a few appraisals can't you with some what if scenarios and you can then i i suppose so. actually one idea just occurred to me too you could liaise with an estate agent couldn't you and see if uh, they, they would think that would be likely to be an issue there as well yes sure i mean generally speaking suburban offices tend to have car parks so you know, the one we're doing in Gerard's cross eight flats from an office, we, we can provide each flat with a car parking space, fine. But suburban, the office wouldn't work without car parking. No. Um, you know, we're doing six flats in Stoke Newington above shops and um, you know, there's no car parking, but no one will ever want, to, want any car parking in that location. So it doesn't make a blind bit of difference. No. So it really depends on the, on, on, on the site what type of units you're doing, whether it's for sale or for rent. Um, but generally speaking, I, no, I haven't had a problem in any of the sites with car parking. The ones that we haven't had car parking for are quite obvious that they're not required. Interestingly enough, where we have done um, uh, in the old days, where we've done HMOs and stuff, and we've had to do full planning permission for those, and they've asked for car parking, um, under full planning permission most of those are not even you know one or two people i mean we've got um one hmo where we've got si we've had to provide six car parking spaces which we have done off street there's right. never more than two cars parked there right you know uh, so, so just because they you know they insist on it under planning it doesn't mean there's a there's actually a demand for it it's yeah. just a way to block you right. it does it does surprise me a bit because i mean i i, I would have thought that you know most people would you know would want a car or something like that, you know. It depends where it is. You know, the, the, the great thing about these high street type developments is that everything is right next to you. Right. Everything, everything is next door to you. You don't need to, you don't even need much storage in your flat. Why do you need to store tons of bottles of wine when you just pop over the road and there's a convenience store open 24-7, you know? It's yeah. just, um, sure. it, 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 that's the way people people live you know yeah i mean obviously um jettisoning the car has been a you know a, a, a long been a strategy in london because i mean it's so difficult it's so expensive in every respect but you know i'd have thought possibly even in suburban high street locations people you know, might want a car but... well a lot of people aren't just doing that i mean we've got a quite a few in london which are next door to um um there's a company called zip they do zip car hire basically. So you have a card and a membership and you just um, take your phone, swipe it over some something on the dashboard, unlock a car and drive it off and, and right. use it for an hour or two. Right. You know, this is the way people are doing things nowadays. A lot of the developments as well in some town centres, you can get long, you know, you can get annual permits for long stay car parts. A lot of yeah. the far were the same and it, it, it depends if it, it, it affects the value, doesn't it really? It comes down to numbers, doesn't it? The, it affects the value and seeing what's what's out there. So, sure, sure. Yeah, thank okay, you. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for your um, your question, Erin. I think we'd better draw that to a close because we've had an hour and a half. Um, so I think really all that's left for me to to do is to say uh, thank you very much, Ranjan, uh, for your inputs, and Joe, thank you very much as well for your stuff. So we have Ranjan. You've got your just to remind everybody. You've got your event on. Sunday. I've got it on Sunday. I, I think I, I just had a couple of comments saying that the link um, that is giving some people problems with the link. So I've put an alternate link okay. for the registration site in just in the chat. Just well, if now. anybody has any problems, they can always contact us and we'll, we'll make sure that they're, they're informed. They should get, everybody will get a copy of the, the recording as well that will go out uh, so they can contact that. And if, if anybody's got any problems, please just just contact us and thank you so much joe as well for your your input uh, and you've got a session on just remind us on friday yeah friday 11 o'clock me and uh, andrew take you through uh, how to find those opportunities using nimbus
so that's brilliant so thank you very much uh for, for your input thank you very much for watching um i've been simon davis we've been nimbus maps and we look forward to helping you succeed in your property investment development goals thank you